Welcome to the MMA Road Show, episode number 404. My name is John Morgan, and Cold Coffee is with me for this special holiday edition of the MMA Road Show. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle motherfucking all the way. Oh, it is to drink with Morgan during the day. That is, hey, that oh, works! That was good! <laughs> he brought the lyrics on the fly. Frosty beverages are in full effect on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. Uh, didn't have the old go-to, by the way. I guess... I, I didn't notice over here at, at, at the Casa de Cold Coffee, man, the, the palatial estate over here has made some significant upgrades in the beverage department. Your new <laughs> beverage director has really done some I, things. They, but they got to keep up on the old the old favorites. Well, though. that's what I was going to say. I'm, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, again, all respect to the beverage director, but please let him know. I, I, I would have liked to have had an award-winning <laughs> Pass Blue Ribbon this afternoon, and he did not have those in stock, but instead – uh, I just reached in and grabbed the first thing I saw. There was uh, just, I mean, just stock full of craft beverages in there. <laughs> and I ended up with, uh, a, a, it's, a, it's a wild one here, but it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a, it's a Cranbert. Yes. It's, it's uh, based on the Cubert, if you'll yes, all remember yes, the old yes, Cubert yes. game back in the day. Uh, the artwork on the can is, you know, kind of looking like that. Probably, uh, I probably, in fact, I probably shouldn't describe it too much because there might be some copyright infringement <laughs> going on here. That maybe, maybe the Red Leg Brewing Company did not exactly uh, clear with the makers. Uh, the, color, <laughs> the color schemes are maybe off a little bit. Uh, a little bit, but uh, it is a a wheat ale with cranberry. Yes, I figured that you know, a little cranberry sauce for the mm. for the holidays or what oh. have you. So good. Mm-hmm. I went with uh, one. It's from the Knee Deep Brewing, and it's uh, called Final Lap. And it's an Italian-style pilsner, so it's real light. Uh, what these are is uh, the place up by um, the airport, the Lazy Dog uh, Beer Company, mm-hmm. which is a really, really cool spot. You could actually take your dog. You can bring and your dog, yeah. And on the patio and everything. They have a beer club there. And on this particular one, uh, every quarter they do a different sort of uh, a limited brew of different um, ones, and this particular one I think was done in conjunction with um, either this one or the one last one was with conjunction of different colleges. I think this one might have just been with different breweries, so they usually get, uh, do a collaboration of different breweries, and the theme on this one was sort of arcade. So I was going to say, that's a video Kramer, game. And then this that's looks like a video game. Of like, like final, what do they call it? Final Run or something like that? or Something out, like that, where out. it was like the, you were in the Corvette racing or right. whatever. Yeah, it's that sort of deal. So, uh, yeah, it's fun. I mean, and then you usually get that, and then you get like a uh, – so, yeah, that's right. This was the Hophead Super Supercade, um, or unless this is just one of the brands. But this is release <laughs> number 16. I want to say this was the Supercade. Nice little custom like an glass arcade. with it. Yeah, and it comes with a glass, and it comes with um, eight of their um, – the different brews, it's usually two of each one, so they have four breweries. And one of the ones in here, uh, I'd have to look, I think it's still in there, is actually from uh, the brewery that's down in uh, Fremont. Uh, shoot, the name is escaping me right now, but I forget what the name of the brewery is. But one of the Vegas breweries is actually in this, oh, that's this cool. release as well. Like, so like to feature the local. Yeah, but, you know, uh, I do need to get on the, the, the beverage director. There's no excuse to not have some of the award-winning uh, oh, Pabst Blue Ribbon in here. I mean, it's just all more pointing to that uh, Pabst should finally just get off their butts and start sponsoring us. It'd be nice if they just dropped off one of those 96 packs oh. that we always see. At that some every point, year, we really do need to make sure that we have one of those on hand. <laughs> every year, somebody finds that picture and sends it to us like, yeah. hey, guys, have you seen this? It's like, yes, every year. And every year I'm like, I want one. That's all I want for Christmas, 100%. That's all I want for Christmas is one of those. 100%. Well, it's nice. We get to do a little day drinking this afternoon. You don't really have too many frosty beverages during the day. But no. uh, there's no event this week. I mean, this is a true break in the sport. Honestly, I like, you know, first of all, it's, it's kind of funny, right? Because, we, we, you know, it's a busy schedule all the time. It's every week, every week, every week, right? Nonstop. And then we'll get one random week off. And I'll be honest with you. Like on Saturday, I'm like, you know, at first at the beginning of the week, you're like, Sweet, you know, I got can do some other stuff or whatever, and then Saturday rolls around. I'm like, 
uh, there's nothing to do today. Like, yeah. right? so, but this one is perfect, right? Because if you look at it, obviously the first week, uh, Saturday with no UFC is Christmas. So obviously Christmas is a big time of year. There's a lot going on. Everybody's got stuff to do. The next one, something happened on that day. The next one, yeah, something has happened that day, <laughs> many thousands of years ago. Uh, and then on Saturday, uh, the following Saturday is New Year's Eve. So that's an easy one to not have an event on. Yeah. Um, and then we do get the the one break, and then we get back to action. But I like so even though. You know, and I like this end of year break because we don't have to do like the media day, the day after Christmas, like we used to. You don't have the weigh-ins on New Year's Eve or whatever. So I like it, but sometimes it does feel this end of year stretch since they've moved over to ESPN feels a little bit long. Uh, but I think this one's like perfect because it's the Saturdays are like super busy. So yeah. I don't think it's going to feel that bad. I, I'm 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 liking this little stretch we got yeah, coming up. Yeah, and, and you're you're absolutely right. It's one of those things that you know we bitch and moan about there always being events, but then like the weekend that there's not, you're like. You don't know what to do with your hands. It's like, what do I do with my hands? <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm this doing. This is what I do. You know, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, if anything else, it's a nice, you know, just reminder to, to reflect back on the other stuff. I mean, mm. we're lucky enough to cover the sport, get to travel on occasion when the road show actually does go on the road. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, you know, it is nice, you know, to be able to take the time to actually look and see, you know, uh, I'm not going to allow myself to uh, be missing anything this weekend, especially when now Christmas is coming up. It's just going to be relaxing, catching up on some sleep, getting out there, getting the steps in, you know, trying to get some more work in the I gym, like you know, I keep like doing it. that stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just because before we know it, uh, we'll be back in the full swing. And I am going to be trying to be better. This year I was really bad on, like, the, not looking ahead on, like, the weeks where there wasn't stuff. Right. To plan to do stuff, like to take weeks off. And last year I found out, you know, supposedly when, when Gannett and you were there, when uh, we, we still made that switch to the managed time off. Right. Which supposedly you could take as many days off as you needed, you know, just cover it with your manager. So even with the days I took off and then with random days that – uh, our managing editor gave me off. I only had 17 MTO days all year long. Which so even before you switched over, you've been entitled like 25, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, so it's like I'm not getting the, the amount. So next year I'm gonna I made it a point. I'm gonna make it a point to use those days. I, you know, I listen, because you, you can't take them with you. We're not, you know, <laughs> not gonna sit here and criticize Gannett policy. Obviously, you as a as a current Gannett employee, we do not want to do that, and I'm not gonna bait you into it. But I would just say corporations as a whole. I read a lot about that, like as yeah. we switched over to that, and a lot of corporations, the study, at least the studies I saw in labor found nobody asks off for as many days as they would have guaranteed off under the previous thing because they yep. feel kind of – you feel bad, right? You're like, right. oh, I don't want to ask for time off. Like, But when it's guaranteed – when you've got that number that you're like, hey, bro, here's your here's your, here's your your 25 bucks. Hand me $1 back every time yep. you take one. You feel it's a little bit – but when you're like, oh, man, I – can I take a couple days yeah. off that you don't want to do it because you feel bad about yeah. it? So it's it's interesting. It's on the on the top. It's like yeah, you get all the time all off the time you want, you want just then ask. you don't ask for the time off. Yeah, and, and and you know it's one of those things that until you realize that you're not getting those days until you're not taking, then you're like, wow, you know what have I been doing? And with one of the great things that I'm hoping to happen when everybody asks Dana, Dana, what's the plans next year? Are you are you trying to get on the road? Or are you going to keep doing stuff at the apex? Of course, they're going to still do some stuff at right. the apex. But Dana's like, if I could, I'd have everyone on the road. Mm -hmm. One's on the road. That means if I don't have to go, then it's not. It's it's, a, it's certainly a lot easier to say, okay, I know there's an event here in Vegas. You know, I just assume that I'm going to work it because I'm here in Vegas. Can't take off for that. But if it's on the road somewhere, hey, how about I take that one off? You know, Smart. so so we'll see. So part of me is like pulling for Dana to to, to take the show <laughs> Let's on the get road. Get the show on the road, buddy. You know, but I do like Apex shows. I do like the home ones as much as you know it can be tedious every week. Uh, you know, having to go down there, it there is a sense of comfort knowing that every week there's an event as well. You mm -hmm. know, because just like like we said this week, when there's no event at the end of the week, you're like you're kind of out of whack. You're like, on Wednesdays, normally I'm going to a media day. Thursdays, I'm not going to the presser. I get my day off. Then Friday, I go to the weigh-ins. Yep. And then maybe I go downtown later on for the, the our, ceremony. Our entire life is built around it's the routine around of fight UFC week. fight week. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> insane. And, and, and part of it's like, you know, that's probably not good. But in the same sense, um, you know, when it's not there, you kind of just feel out of whack, you, you know. Do. But I remember when we hadn't traveled because of the pandemic, when we were stuck at the house, those first like couple events, the first weeks, everything felt weird, like trying to get back into the swing. And I see the same thing from guys, uh, journalists that don't cover the, the event normally. And then all of a sudden, an event 
comes and they get on the road, right. they're like, dude, I just kind of my timing's off. Kind of ru- you're rusty, whack, man. Because you're rusty. You're rusty. There's legit. There's there's ring rust when it comes to not covering an event. Silly as that sounds. You, know, you get in the routine. You know the so feel. Crazy. It's just I know to switch my memory card here. I know to yep. drag this over here. I know if I export while this is going on, I can still look to this. And yep. you get that balance. It's crazy. It's like you get yep. so many reps that you know exactly how to make it flow. Yep. And it's funny because when you're not out of that routine, you're just like, what am I? Why am I like? You're like, I know I'm supposed to do something right now. What am I forgetting? What mm-hmm. am I forgetting? And then blah blah blah. Uh, there is something nice about the routine, but you're, I mean, we just got to be better on, you know, trying to find that time. And that's why I'm really happy that lately you've been getting the travel time with the family. You guys yeah, are in Atlantic City. I mean, because you got to find the balance. And uh, even if it's, you know, later than sooner, you've now found that balance and you're enjoying it and you're getting to reap the benefits, spending the time with Eli while you can before he for- finally 100%. says, I'm done hanging out with my parents. It's, <laughs> it, and, 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 and that's not so far along. And, and you know, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, that was a huge reason, you know, I made the change that I did. Um, and part of it was, listen, I want to spend as, as much time as I can with my son. Um, well, and it's funny because, you know, and I, I mentioned it here before, but I'll say it again because I think it'll resonate with parents. Is like in my head, I was like, well, by 18, he's 10 right now. By 18, like, he's going to be out of the house because he's going to go to college somewhere. That's only eight years away. You know what I mean? Like, I got to take advantage of it. And then my mom chimed in because I was having that conversation with her. And she's like, 18? She's like, it's only going to be a couple more years till he doesn't want to hang out yeah. with you anymore. And I was like, Oh yeah, when you're he totally school, right. When he hits high school, I yeah. remember when I was like in high school. The last thing I wanted to do was hang out with like parents or even my brothers and sisters. Right. I mean, like, no. If I saw him at school, cool. We did school function or what? We got wasted. Or Chasing whatever. girls and Chasing playing girls. sports, That's and it. you know what I mean. Like, like you're not hanging out with dad. And your kid's got a ton of sports. So, I mean, like, mm-hmm. he's gonna have plenty of opportunities to not be home. Yeah, you know, like it's gonna get to the point where you're gonna be like. We need to get this kid a car so he can take his own ass to all these things, and then you're going to see him even less. I know, I know. It's great. We, we got to do Atlantic City this past we got about weekend. Six years. We got six years. Uh, maybe less. I think four. Because then he's 16. 15. Well, at least yeah, 16. You have a car, and then you can. Yeah. Leave. 14, 15. You may not want to hang out with me, but you ain't got no car, yeah. so you got to hang he's, out with me. Because <laughs> yeah, you're you're absolutely right. 14, 15. He's not going to want to hang out, but yeah. he's he's going to be stuck with 16, you. 16. You got a car, and you're now gone, and I'm not seeing you anymore. But yeah, we went to Atlantic City this past weekend. It was fun. First of all, I'll tell you uh, if you have not seen CFFC 116 and you are fiending for a little bit of some MMA to watch, uh, check out the show, man. It was a really, really good show, man. Action-packed, a bunch of big highlights and, you know, comeback finishes and crazy turnarounds. It was just a really, really good show. I uh, had a lot of fun uh, working with my man CM Punk. But, yeah, had had my wife there, had my son there, had my mom there as well, and, and we stayed an extra day. I actually skipped the UFC event just so we could stay an extra day. We That's went, like two in a row. It's crazy, I know. We went. To, we went <laughs> I felt weird, man. I watched the prelims. I watched the prelims in my hotel room. And first of all, shout out to uh, CFSC and shout out to the Hard Rock Atlantic City because uh, they knew my family was coming and they hooked me up with uh, an executive suite. So we had this insane, Baller. oh man, insane, bro. I can't even tell you how big this room was, and it had like a 75-inch, 80-inch TV in it as well in the living room, and so that's where we ended up watching the World Cup the next day. And uh, but anyway, you know, so uh, watched the prelims in the room, then went and had uh, dinner at Il Molino, which is a really nice uh, Italian restaurant there inside the Hard Rock Hotel. Hard Rock Hotel Atlantic City is nice. If you can go see a show there, super, super nice. Um, went and had dinner there, and then went out to uh, went out to a club, man. We actually went to the a club that was playing like uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s music, and uh, had a good time. A little bottle service over there, maybe maybe a little bit too much bottle service, and then uh, <laughs> watch watch the World Cup the too next day. Too much bottle service with you, what? Well, dude. But the wor- dude, I know that, that final. Oh my god! That, Holy so, cow! I love soccer, and so I planned it. So I was like, look, we're gonna stay an extra day. And then Sunday is the World Cup final. I was like, I want to watch that. So I was like, let's get an evening flight. <laughs> so they were flight. on their own. They no. were on their own while you watched it. Did they watch no, it No, they watched it with me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. they watched it with me. So I said, so, but I, I scheduled our flights. I was like, let's take an evening flight so I can watch the World Cup final. And it was funny because about 70 minutes in, I was, I'll be honest, I was cheering for Argentina. I wanted to see Messi get his. You know? But about 70 minutes in, it's 2-0, and they're just cruising, and France is playing flat. And I'm like, I didn't really need to stay here the whole day yeah. to watch this. I'm like, I could have just gone home and re- yeah. watched the highlights. Then in the span of two minutes. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Then they even it up. And then in the, the overtime, you know what yeah. I mean? The extra time is, is, is the, the goals back and forth and the penalty kicks. Sh- I mean, 
phenomenal World Cup final. Yeah. So yeah, it was a fun weekend. I got to hang out with the family and uh, yeah, it's been you know between that and the Thanksgiving trip with PFL and uh, it's it's been a fun way to close the year. It's not yeah. not something I can continue to do. Uh, the pocketbook <laughs> will not allow me to continue bringing the family on board all these trips. Um, but it is man, it's so important. You know, I was talking to. And, and again, I mean, maybe we're waxing a little poetic today, but there's not a ton of it maybe to talk about. But I was talking to Damon Jackson uh, yesterday, actually, and uh, you know, I was asking him. He's he's got his fight coming up with Dan Ige. I was asking him, hey, are you gonna are you gonna use action, you know, as your as your nickname? Because you remember he used that last time for his brother that has passed away. It was his brother. His older brother was always Action Jackson on the football field, and so he took that moniker on. But I was like, are you gonna keep it because? It's a fit. It's a touching tribute, you know what I mean. But yeah. at the same time, like, do you want that little pinch of emotion right before a fight's about to start? You know yeah. what I mean. Where you dialed in and Buffer's saying your name, and maybe you think about your brother. And he was like, "No, 100%." He's like, "I'm I'm gonna keep that as my name." He's like, "And not just for my brother, but just to remind me." He's like, "Man, my brother was 37 years old, dude." He's like, "Nothing is guaranteed." He's like, "Do not waste a single day of your life." He's like, "I want to remind me." To, to, to go hard 100% to take care of my family, to spend every day. And, and it's so true, man. It's just, I just especially, man, I, I don't know. That's, that just has resonated yeah. with me so much. Like anything I can do with my son, anything I can do with family right now, like I, I want to do it, you know. So anyway. So we got to come up with a nickname for you then. Because if Action Jack, but it, if Action rhymes with, ja well, Action Jackson sort of rhymes. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. So what are we going to do with we got to have a nickname for you that means you'd embrace the day but rhymed with Morgan. Mm, not a lot of good ones out there. I know, not, right? Yeah. Not a lot of good Morgan rhyming names <laughs> other than Oregon or something, which can be taken in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, we got to work on that. we gotta, we got to figure something out. Uh, but, yeah, no, I mean, well, that's a – it's a when you when you lay it out like that, I mean, it's a powerful message, and it's true. I mean, and maybe that's just one of those things at end of the year – before the start of the new year when everybody normally does their resolutions this is that time of year where everybody's like what can i do better next year there you know we just had thanksgiving where everybody thinks about and reflects upon what they're thankful for but now here we are at the end of the year you know and, and i think it points back in your face the the importance of family your health what you're doing with yourself and then going into the new year what you want to how you want to capitalize you know going forward so mm -hmm. i mean um uh, I love Damon Jackson. I mean, like, oh, how, how can you not like that dude? Um, it's funny you say that, but I remember just seeing the picture online of uh, how Fortis celebrated their – had, like, a Christmas party or something like that, you know, and you're looking at all the faces there. I mean, what a good gym and good people. So, yeah, it's that time of the year, man. Um, you know, time to be thankful, time to reflect upon what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and what we need to fix for next year and have some fun and keep keep this ball rolling. For instance – yeah. I promise next year oh, goodness. to not drop any f bombs at the airport and nearly get arrested. Yeah, you should probably not do that. <laughs> My, I, I I told the full story on the and a half episode, uh, but yeah, I almost got arrested at the airport trying to get home from Philadelphia. That wasn't. See, don't people, drop f bombs. People always say that I have f bomb f bomb. F now I'm having speaking <laughs> problems. This is why I don't drink anymore. I can't speak anymore. And then people say I have f bomb problems. I don't think I've ever been not allowed to board anything because of my language they try you know they tried to they tried to s slow play me so that i wouldn't get on and i'd get locked out that's a long story i'm not gonna get I, i've yeah. let it go i've let it go i've let the <laughs> let emotions go. go yes let it go. I, i've let my frustration <laughs> and anger go i have forgiven them for their trespasses upon me <laughs> and and i and i am i am happy now uh, i will remind everybody by the way so Go watch CFFC 116 if you haven't seen it. I'm telling you, there were some really good fights, and I'll put it on the radar. Make sure you circle the calendar for December 30th because uh, we've got Fury Professional Grappling 6 uh, on UFC Fight Pass as well. I think we're at the latest count right now. I think we have 11 UFC athletes on the roster uh, for cow. that. So, yeah, it's going to be a fun one. Where's that one? Uh, 2300 Arena in Philadelphia. So Philly. Yeah, heading back out to Philly That's next Punk Thursday. Theory, uh, Chicago. He's a Chicago, Chicago guy. That's right. You're yeah. right. So, right. heading back out there on Thursday events on Friday, flying home on Saturday, and then, uh, you know, we could talk about it a little bit next week, of course, but that Bellator Rising card, that'll be on New Year's Eve as well. I think that's a great card as well. Do you call that a Bellator Rising card, or do you call it a Rising Bellator? Well, it, technically it is a Rising card. I, I guess I say Bellator Rising just because Bellator is like the higher profile, but it really yeah. is a Rising, rising card event. because – uh, they just said it was just easier to do that, and then they'll make the next one a Bellator card because it's going to be their rules. It's going to be, but yeah. dude, I love it, man. The the, the it's press, great, it's going to be great. The press conference yeah. they or the conference media call that they had yesterday, where Scott Coker and Saki Gabaro on there, I loved it because Coker just laid it out there, and it's 100 percent true. He's like, look, 
you put your risk on the line. Because that, that's what this is yeah. all about, right? I mean, the reputation le- of your brand and your the, promotion. The reputation of your brand is on the yeah. line. He's like, but that's the martial arts way. That's yeah. what you should do. Now, listen, there's more reasons why promotions don't co promote a lot in terms of, like, yeah. for instance, who has the TV deal? You know, yeah. who who gets the sponsorship dollars? Who get, you know what I mean? So there's, yep. it's more than just putting your reputation on the line, but that is a huge part of it, right? Because if you're Bellator and you go over and you take that roster that you took, and let's say for some strange ass reason, maybe it's because your guys aren't used to fighting in a ring. Maybe it's because they're not used to the, you know, the soccer kicks and the stomps, and yep. they and they get caught because they're like, oh, I thought I was safe there and I wasn't. Weird things can happen, and I favor a lot of the Bellator fighters. But weird things can happen. What if you're Bellator and you roll over there and you go 0 and five? Yeah. And then you got to – guess what? You got to jump back on a plane, fly back home, and yep. you got to put your arms around it. No, these are the best fighters in the world. <laughs> we got the best in the world. I'm like, didn't they just go over to Japan to get their ass beat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but don't worry about that. Tune in to Showtime <laughs> this Friday night. For, we so, got a pay-per-view coming up. We want you to really pay for it. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, so I, I – um, I, I applaud them for doing this, and, and I'm excited about it. It's not it's not quite pride versus UFC level back in the day, but it's it's the start of something, man. And I, I'm really I'm really excited to see the card. I will say though, and again, we'll we've got another week episode next week that we can help continue to preview this. But um, the fact that we got to catch it on tape delay here is a little bit wonky. Yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not happy about that. I mean, the one thing you know, like you said, you're it's it's tough to you know. Put your your reputation of your company on the line, you know. Uh, I could I could hear Dana ultimately say, "Well, it's not the UFC that's fighting; it's the fighters." You know, I mean, every fighter has a good day, a bad day, you know. But there is something well done. That to that be said good. about yep. yeah. <laughs> well done to get yourself out of that yeah. one. I like that. There is something to be said about you know, if somebody is strong in a particular market and you want to reach those fans that love a particular promotion in that area, this is what this is doing. I mean, like. Ryzen has their followers that absolutely love and adore what they want, you know, and we've seen some crossover in the past with the Bellator, but what better to introduce, uh, you know, the stars of your organization with their with their fans, I mean, mm-hmm. and vice versa, you know. I think most people that are watching Bellator are probably already well-versed with the the cream of the crop of the, the Ryzen guys that are going to be doing this, but still, there is something about being able to introduce yourself to another promotions uh fan base i think the ufc probably would be like you know well those people are already probably like us or if they don't like us by now who needs them you know we have our own markets but there is something to be said about you know if you can use the the strength of one particular brand in another market to give yourself a foothold why wouldn't you absolutely you know and as long as the dollars make sense and if the promotion makes sense and there's you know, you're, you're both sharing the load and you're both kind of the A side. I mean, there's always going to be a sort of A side depending on where the, the broadcast is happening. You know, in America, it's going to be Bellator. Right. You know, overseas, it's going to be Ryzen, you know. But the being able to, to work it out where it makes sense together, I mean, it just – I think the positives that come out of it definitely benefit in a way – outweighs, the, you know, any risk that maybe, okay, maybe some of our guys might lose – you know, still, I mean, you're going to be introducing them to people that maybe have never watched them before. Yep. And ultimately, those are the people that you want to, you know, look at your product. Yep. And Bellator hasn't shied away from going overseas to all these other little markets that nobody's going to. I mean, they've already, they do multiple events in like Italy and all other places that nobody else is going to right now. I mean, they're doing all the right things. Um, you know, s- people want to criticize, you know, maybe how well the pay-per-view did and other stuff, but, you know, Maybe if it's like a bit of a slow roll or, you know, they're still building strength and they're building strength in other markets, you know, and do you see it? I don't know if they could say the same, you know, it's been a while since they broke into a new market. And even then, you know, sometimes it's maybe not as good as they want to do anyway. So why not use a well-built uh, fan base already in an area to help break into that market. Well, you know? the, the UFC has such a, a dominant foothold. That, like, I understand why they're not interested in co-promotion whatsoever and why it doesn't do them because all it is is the U, the UFC is head and shoulders above everybody, and, and that's just that's just honest. I mean, yeah. I'm not, say, I'm not saying – I'm not saying is fighting for number two. I'm not saying in quality of fights. I'm not saying in quality of athletes. I'm just saying in terms of brand recognition, right. market share, they, they are far and away the biggest. And so for them, they're just reaching down and pulling somebody up, right? But everybody else, man, everybody else out there, that, like you said, they're fighting for number two. Man, I think they should try. And it's it's not easy to do. Even Coker said. And, you know, Coker and Saka Kabar have known each other for 20 for years. For a long time. long yep. time. They've worked together. Yep. They trust each other. And even Coker said it's not easy to do this. There's yep. hurdles along the way. There's things. So if, even for two guys that are that close to admit, hey, this isn't easy, I'm not blamed, but 
I would think everybody out there, every other organization out there should just be at least willing to be willing. like, why don't we do a one-off here? Why don't we do a series? Yep. You know, we'll just do a home-and-home home series with this one or, you know, like like college football sets up, right? I mean, you know? Yes. I mean, I think that's the smartest thing. Like, if you if you think that, oh, man, why do we have to go to your place? Bro, just next time we'll do it at mine, at, at yours. We'll sign up for two fights. Yeah. I'll do I one in yours, you idea. do one in mine, and, yeah. and we just talent share for that. And it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. I mean, I get it. You know, like there's, you know, different organization. Every organization has their own cultural sort of scenario. You know, how it's run, you know, might somehow bash heads with how you run your organization. But if you have a mutual benefit where you guys can come to the table and actually talk things out yeah it certainly makes a lot of sense for the smaller organizations to try to build it i mean how else are you going to be able to you know like i said just keep getting a foothold in other markets because yeah. a lot of times you're just trying to make your in inroads into another market on your own it's tough. sometimes it's cost prohibitive and sometimes you, your organization you just run differently that you don't have that built-in respect that a lot of places want you know you try to go to a lot of asian countries uh, they expect if if it's not run by an Asian or something, they might not even want to even talk to you to mm -hmm. get in the door. But if you have a history working with it, okay, this this person, this business has shown themselves to be respectful. They sort of have the same sort of mindset. Okay, we could talk with them, you know. And a lot of times that just you know, just by doing these little sort of things, I mean, it, it pays itself off. But and especially as you said, in a new market, like in a I new get market. it. If it's somebody yeah. that you're you know, in your market that you're trying to, like, battle for ticket sales. Then you are bringing somebody – then you are pulling somebody up. Right. You're like, you're normally my competitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but get that. But going into new markets, for sure. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Like, if you're the guy that runs that area over there and I want to get into your market, if I can work with you and you help me get my foot in the door so where that place is more open to me coming to do business around that area, we don't – all. yes, we might be competitors, but there's nothing wrong with – strong good competition because as long as there's a strong fan base that wants content mm -hmm. they're going to look multiple places for it people don't watch one show and be like okay man i feel really good i watched the fight this week and i don't need to watch anything else for a week <laughs> so true you know most people are like dude i really like this sport i want more and and it's tough for one organization i remember when fight pass didn't wasn't able to have a 24 7 channel when you went to the thing they just didn't quite have the content but they've been curating they've oh. been curating it same with espn they were taking as much as they could until they could start building up that thing. And it's the same thing for everyone everywhere. There's never enough content just in one particular organization to handle the desire everywhere. So why not, you know, work together and help bring everybody up? Because still your product and the content that you put out is going to differentiate itself because you might look at Bellator and what they put out. You look at Rising and what they put out. You look at One Championship, what they put out. You look at UFC. They all have their unique sort of differences right. in how they do it. They're all in the same sort of space. But you have people that like, uh, well, even outside of just like junkies <laughs> like us that watch it all. But you have people that watch multiple different stuff that aren't paid to watch the, this right. particular stuff. So there's always going to be a need for it, you know. And I mean, they just got to keep at it. So I, I think it it makes sense uh, to deal with other people. And just like when we see other jur other media outlets. It, we realized a long time ago that it does no good to just hate on your competitors and not want to work with your competitors because nope. at some point down the line, you're going to need something from them. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it might mean, hey, I want to get in that market. You know, we've been able – I know we're competitors, but if we can do something that helps scratch your back and it scratches my back and we both make money out of it, why not? I agree. You know? I agree. So I applaud I, these guys for doing it. I wish more people would follow their lead. I mean, and, and you hear that over and over again about the, the respect that fighters have for Coker, the, the respect that the fighters have for their the organizations that are doing this. I mean – there's a reason why they respect him because they, these guys are open to different other things and they're taking care of their people, you know. I love it. I'm looking forward to yeah. it. So, so, so mark your calendars. The 30th, you're watching Fury Professional Grappling. The 31st, <laughs> you're avoiding spoilers uh, because it's going to be aired in, in prime time, but it'll already be done in the day. But you want to watch you, it. What's your best tips for avoiding spoilers? Uh, just stay off your phone. Yeah, yeah. totally got to stay yeah, off your phone. Like stay gonna, off your phone. Good luck with that. One. Yeah, it's uh, no. Put your phone down, <laughs> face down. Don't yeah, don't get on to it. Be enjoying your family. It's New Year's That's Eve. It. It's Enjoy New Year's Eve. Family. Have a nice day. Watch some college football or something like that. I'm sure there's some good games on the 31st. Games on. Is that when the playoffs start? Is the 31st or 30th or 31st? Or just like some that? or just some games. Watch some games. There's definitely games. Like there's ball games starting like early on. Like, I mean that's what you do on news. Even if you're not a college football fan, you throw some college football on in the background, right? Because there's so many random bowl games. It's nuts. You put that on. 
on, you keep your phone away, you enjoy the time with your family, then you tune on Showtime via, via tape delay. Or, or maybe, maybe you just watch the replay of Fury Professional Grappling again during the day. <laughs> I mean, because you know it's going to be so good on the 30th that you're like, you know what? I got to watch, gotta watch that, that again back. the 31st, man. I got John Morgan and CM Punk were so good on the mic. I got I to gotta watch that back. And then, and then you, and then you watch that via tape. Like, all right, uh, listen. The <laughs> ongoing conversation uh, continues to be associated around MMA judging, and understandably so. I will say, uh, you and I haven't talked about it, but this past weekend's main event between Jared Cannonier and Sean Strickland, even though there were opposing 49-46s where yeah. every round was scored exactly opposite from two judges. That's so crazy. I'm going to be honest with you and just say. I don't really have a problem with it. Like, that fight, I watched it on a plane on the yeah. way home, and I'm literally, I mean, round by round, I'm, I'm I, 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 minuscule little fractions. I ended up going 1-3-5, and five, Jared Cannonier, 2-4 for Strickland. But even that, I, I, I can't say that, like, I really just feel like that is the proper score. You know, so I, I don't know yeah. about you, but to be as weird as the scores were this past weekend, I feel like that fight was so damn close. You just really can't get pissed at the judges. Yeah, I mean, it was close. I did, in my head, when I was watching it, you know, and it's funny, it's hard to not sort of, even though I know it's not that whole total, you know, the total fight taken into account for how you grade right. it, you know. But when I – when I think about one, I was watching it. Obviously, we we're doing interviews and other sort of stuff and trying to get other stuff done. But every time I looked up there, it was always Jared Cannonier that was pushing the pace. It was pushing in the direction. I mean, Strickland was, you know, doing his sort of thing, going out there and going for it. But it was always a jab here, a jab there. And I just felt like there was more work coming from Jared's side. So when it got to the end, I kind of – I. I would have to rewatch to say, okay, I think it was this round, this round, this round. I had that overall feeling that I felt like he did – the more work in the overall mm -hmm. fight, so I was going to give him the nod. But I did sort of feel that it was, if I had to say three to two, that it felt like that, uh, that it was definitely Jared. Yep. I just felt like Strickland could have did more. I just felt like I wanted to see him do more and get more, um, just more big shots where I'd feel like, oh, wow, you know, I never got that feeling. So when it came down to it, I didn't by any means feel like it was a robbery, but I was also very sort of surprised when I heard a judge give it kind of crazy all in his direction because I was just like I don't remember him really ever controlling a particular round to the point where I was just like I just felt like they made it seem like it was dominant I thought it was going to be unanimously in Jared's direction yep. so I was a little surprised that it wasn't um, but it did both of them were just very very sort of respectful of their striking they both knew that they had that sort of power but I was just surprised it stayed uh, standing like so primarily and it was just sort of it wasn't like a, a slobber knocker by any means like a sparring match at yeah times, you know? it was just kind of like it was just sparse striking yeah. you know, that went through and i know that sean was kind of putting up you know numbers of like rounds and strikes and stuff but like for me it didn't feel like i ever saw a round where like there was like a heavy where you could just claim victory where i was just like, like oh my god sean just clearly outstruck right him. it was just like a jab here a jab here you know, just kind of walking forward, jab here, jab here. But then you'd see Jared come with a one-two, you know, a couple of two shots, a nice little combos. And it was those combos that kept adding up in my mind mm -hmm. that made it feel like he was getting the better of the connections and stuff. So it's like Sean might have, you know, threw four or five jabs in there, but I'd see that one good two-three combo, you know, and then you're just like, wow, I really felt like that was kind of leaning towards Jared, you know, just in terms of the action. But um, – and I just uh, – we wanted – I asked for him to come back in the back, and he, he – the, the UFC said he politely declined. Interesting. And then we see him go on Instagram, like, right after. I was like, bro, he could have had the whole room. I don't know why he didn't want or why he chose not to. That's I mean, interesting. But I definitely reached out, and, and uh, UFC staff went and asked him because I even asked them the other guys in the room. They were like – because I'm not going to name names, but someone like, well, what'd you ask for him? I was like, because, bro, you know, he's going to, anything he says is going to be better than what Jared's going to give us <laughs> afterwards. Like, no offense a, to Jared. From a views perspective, Sean, views. Sean, Sean like, drives the views. Yeah, I mean, like, Sean, whatever Sean says, I mean. And it was such a close us. fight. I, I wouldn't hate to hear it. It's something yeah. like, you know, it'd be different if it was like a clear one sided thing and, it, you know, he definitely didn't win. Like, the, yeah. I always say, like, if guys get their ass beat, like, don't force them to come talk yeah, to the media. Yeah, and if they're like, almost concussed or if they are concussed, yeah. the last thing I'm, saying, the thing I'm going to do is, like, yes, please drag him in front of this dog and pony show. Yeah. But, and then it was clearly, you could tell he was upset, and I was like, oh, well, let's give him a chance to say something. Because I remember somebody was like, why would you ask for him? I was like, because it's fucking yeah, Sean. Like, it's don't you think he'd want to say anything? You razor know? thin. But then he was like, they said he politely declined, and then before we even left 
was already on the building. He had already, you know, went and said how he was, you know, sort of disgusted. I was like, bro, he could have said on us. I don't know if he. Maybe he's like, I'll get my views. You don't get your views. Or, or he was just like, I want to say what I want to say, and Not I don't want. I don't want to have to answer any questions of whether I could have did more. Could've you know what that. rounds? You know, I mean, I get it. You know, like I just felt like. You know, don't say that we didn't give you a chance to say anything. Right. A lot of times we get all that, you know, fighters say that all the time. Why aren't you asking for the losers? Right. You know, and it's just like in this case, this could have been a definitely contested. There were some people that thought it could have yes. went the other way. Well, let's give them a that A lot shot. of times we don't ask to speak to the fighter that lost because yeah. we want to allow them their peace and not have to yeah. deal with us. Just to, to let the record reflect Yeah. That. <laughs> well, and, and but, but – you know, nine out of ten times too. I mean, it's they've also been injured or something yeah. like that. So you I'm know? saying for their own for their own. So yeah. my my take on judging has always been, and I and I believe this for for years. I mean, I've been covering the sport for a long, long time, and I've stood around all the time, and I've heard, ah, oh, we need a half point system. Ah, oh, we need the pride system. Ah, oh, we need. The, and I have always said that look, I, the ten nine system that, that we have, I don't believe is a perfect system by any stretch, but I do believe it can work. And what I've always said is that to me, it's not about just, you know, what system we're using. It's about how the system is administered and how it's maintained and how the how it's, you know, the, the education process with the judges. You know, getting qualified judges, making sure they're educated, making sure it's constant improvement. And, I, and I've heard a lot of people say, and, and, and fairly so, that, look, it's not a well-compensated position. So to ask that they put in these hours of training or that they be registered or whatever, it's not a, a realistic assessment. But I disagree with that. It's not a, a great-paying job, but it is a job that you can yeah. make some money off of. And it's very, very important, you know, that this it's stuff is done. Especially for the, the fighters who's – well-being and their 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 money book pays massive. On it it kind of in that sense, it makes it sound really bad. It was like you're going to underpay the people that actually have a heavy uh, opportunity to affect a fighter's pay. And this fighter might only fight twice a year, right? And if you have someone that's like, well, I'm only doing it just for the little bit of penny money. I'm not really happy doing this. It's not worth my time because I'm not really getting paid. It's like you're the last person that should be in that role. If exactly. That's what you're, if that's what you're saying, because there's a bunch yeah. of people that are passionate about that would yeah. love to, to like, do it in a just get way. The F out. So I've always said that I think, you know, to, to me, I, I, and, and I've said it from the beginning, and I'll, and I'll keep saying this because I believe it's the truth. Like I said, I think that these guys should have constant education. I think there should be a constant, transparent, essentially like evaluation system like and a review score, process. A, a review process, 100%, yep. where when you say, you know, why were those three judges selected for the title fight? Well, the reason they were selected for the title fight is because if you look at our current rankings of how performance, they're the three performing at the highest level of performance right now. That's why I'm going with them. I think it should be constantly monitored, and I think it should be transparent. I have no issue whatsoever with it being a publicly posted number. This judge is the one that's, you know, and again, I know that the evaluation process isn't necessarily easy because how do you determine what, you know, their performance should have been, et cetera. But I think that it can be developed and I think it can be put in place. So that's been my thing is that I think the system can work. The 10-point must system can work, but it's got to have constant education. It's got to have constant evaluation. And I think that that would, would, would benefit hugely. The other thing that I've always said is I would like to have transparency from the people in charge. Okay, I want to hear why did a judge make that decision? Why did why did what was it? Because I think if you if I can hear that, if I can hear that a judge listened, you know, they know the criteria, they cited the criteria, and this is what they observed. Now I may disagree with them, but at least I know. Okay, hold on. This person knows the criteria. This person definitely knows what they're watching, and this is how they interpret it. And maybe they made a mistake, but at least I know. But we don't get that. But I, I set that all up to say that because one thing I've always said is that I understand why that these officials aren't allowed to go speak to the media. And that's why I think it could be an executive director. It could be a media representative. It could be somebody that speaks for them. Because this Doug Crosby interview with Chael Sonnen, now he's done this before. And I'm not doing this just to throw Doug Crosby under the bus. But if you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. It's on Chael Sonnen's podcast. About a 38-minute interview, I believe. Now Listen. Chael and him are buddies, so to call it an interview, it's not a real formal interview, and so because of that, it, it kind of takes some weird flows here and there, and they kind of go off on tangents that don't really have anything to do with anything. So a lot of it, I think, is just essentially kind of wasted time and discussion between two friends. Um, but I think when you get down to what's being addressed and and any type of defense of the controversial scorecards as of late, it's not there. It's just not there, and and – I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think the interview does Doug Crosby any justice whatsoever to defend himself or to make himself look any better. I mean, you know, the the quote that I saw a lot of people grabbing with and running with, which is 100% true, is where Doug Crosby says, you know, think about it, man. I've got to watch five minutes of this, of this and then only get a couple seconds, 
you know, to make a decision and, 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 and to put down a numerical value, and that's very difficult to do. Well, anybody that's been through the process will say you're, you're supposed to be scoring as you go along yeah. because if there's like, a foul – what are you doing up to that point? Well, that's it. If there's a foul – uh, and the and the round ends, you know, you're supposed to be able to turn in a partial score. So at that time, you've got it. You you have to have the score in your head yeah. as it goes. Um, and and there is, you know, there is something to be said for, you know, for anybody that doesn't know how it works. And I think most of the people listening here will, but just in case you don't, you know, the judges do turn in their score at the end of each round. And essentially, the round ends, and a fourth official is on the outside, and they immediately take the piece of paper from the first person, then they go to the second person, then they go to the third person, then they take that all back to the scorekeeper uh, at the table, and the scorekeeper writes it all down. Now, I will say, there is something to be said for if you're in that first chair position, essentially, as soon as the bell sounds, that guy's reaching out for your card. So you are kind yeah. of under the gun of like, yep. you better know what your 10-9 is right now. Now, I, I, I can't imagine if you were like, hang on. Okay, yeah. You know what I mean? I can't imagine if you said I need two beats just to guarantee in my head yep. that you would get it. Now, but so you can argue if you're in that third position, you get more time. But yeah, you need to agree. So again, I just it's it's a weird thing because I want transparency from these people, but in this situation we kind of got transparency, and I don't think Doug Crosby did himself any favors whatsoever. And yeah. I think if you ever wonder sometimes when we say, Well, why can't these people talk to the media? Why aren't they allowed to go speak to us? This is why. Yeah, and there's no, and there's nothing that says a judge can't be making notes or doing whatever as the fight's going on. I would think if 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 I see something that's something where 100%. even if you're like halfway through the round, you could already be jotting to yourself of points that you think like like you said a foul. If you need to have specific things like that that said, all right, if there's a point deduction, do you forget that or do you have to write it down or do whatever? You figure like there's a running tally in your head as that fight go as that round's going on. And then you just adjust it as the thing's going on. You know, when it starts, okay, both guys are 10-10. Okay, one guy's starting to get into the better strikes, whatever. Okay, now I'm leading 10-9. Okay, now I need to deduct a point because of this. Okay, now it's a 9-9. Yep. You know, and if you need to be taking notes, I mean, there's nothing that says you don't. There's you 100% can't. not anything that says it. And, in fact, I would highly encourage it, man. Yeah. Have some other, and you'll see some of the top judges that do have their notes with them. And right. and, and, and and it doesn't need to be – I mean, obviously, you don't want to take your eyes off the action to write, like, whole sentences or something. Right. But what's wrong with having like a, a okay? I got red corner here. I got blue corner here. I got two columns. I'm gonna put you know significant strikes. Not in the, it's not significant strikes in the way that it's yeah. counted in, in the stats. But I mean like a, a strike that stood out to me is like ooh that one got him. Right. I'll get that. Or I got like a, a takedown right here. And all I want to do is something happens. I just put a little tick, tick, tick. You know. And I, and now I've got kind of official stat. Not yeah. official stat, but stats for yeah, me. Yeah, because they don't have access to the stats that we see on TV, and I think a lot of times people forget. They're like, wow, man, this guy, you know, when they show the stats after, they're like, well, he had 38 strikes. The other guy had 21. They don't know that. They don't know that. Right. You know, they, they have to gauge each of those little moments. But there's nothing that says they can't sort of follow along, keep track, and especially if you're the kind of guy that's like, wow, I only have two minutes to gather my thoughts, or less than two minutes, yeah. I have seconds. Well, then you're, you need to change your process. Like you're, there's something wrong with your process if if you're well only said. at the point where you're only thinking about the round after the round's done. Well said. What are you doing the rest of the time? You know, it doesn't sound like you're doing an effective use of your time. It sounds like you're just space case sitting in the seat, and then you're like, okay, I have 10 seconds to reflect on that round. What do I remember? What do I remember? Oh shit! Well, guys, come to get my score. Let me just put a number down. I did years and years you know? and years and years of play by play for MMA Junkie, right? Where yeah. every Saturday night I was the dude doing play by play. For the entire card. Yeah. And I can tell you on numerous occasions over the years, round ends, and I would go back and read, like skim through my play by play real quick just to remember, hold on, what happened what? at the first, what yep. happened at the second one? And I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like, I think 10 9, but you always want to confirm yep. yourself. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. No. And I would just skim through my, my play by play of that round before I'd write down my score. Yep. Same thing, man. Yep. I, and I think you nailed it right there. Not having the problem. If you're saying that that's an impossible task, then change your process, change right? Change your process. And, 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 and a little bit of notes, a little bit of something will be there. So, I don't know. I, I heard that, and I'm not trying to pile on Doug Crosby, man. I, I know that, you know, he kind of alluded to the fact that he he's open to criticism but feels attacked at some times. And, and I know this is a – man, this is a thankless job, right? Because when yeah. you get it right, I mean, nobody ever goes back and goes, man – those judges absolutely killed it. Can we give them a little bonus tonight? When you get it right, it's just, yep. well, you did your job and you got it right. And when you get it wrong or when you see something different, you take loads of abuse. Yep. For, again, what we said is not that much money. So I do not want to make it any worse for Doug Crosby than it has to be. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to be respectful by this. But I would say 
I don't believe that interview that he gave to Chilson and did himself any favors whatsoever. And I don't think it helped the craft in terms of us saying, I would love for these guys to be able to be more transparent and to yeah. be able to speak. When things like this happen, that's just going to have the commission going, you see? Yep. You see? We can't let these guys talk to the media. Yeah. You know? and, and, and so Because he spoke, he spoke out of line. It seemed like he wasn't in line with some of the stuff he said with what the actual rules are. I mean, it does make me want to – you know, I know recently some uh, journalists and media were able to kind of go through – the different classes to just right. follow along with what the judge and I think that'd be a great idea. I wish they would do that more often and so others could do it. But yeah, it just felt like some things were sort of out of line. But you know, recently we had talked about last week how uh, end of the year, one of the last things on the commission, they had showed all these different judges that were up for review mm-hmm. or, or up for um, renewal for the next year. What does that mean? Do they think about okay? Do they do they even review like their past year? Do they look at the past things, their past performances, or does it like every other time we see one of these big, huge line items on one of these commissions? There, there's a set of options that are presented. The other commissioner said, you know, yep. uh, executive commissioner, is, is this is this what you think is and good? You, and you grab anybody the rubber have, stamp and, and, yeah, and, and you dip else it in the ink, <laughs> and then they just blink. It's gone. You know, it, it'd be nice to know that. What does that really mean when something's up for for renewal? Does that mean there's been a review process of the past year to say, okay, they they've made that you know they've they were up to muster, they've done the job, or is it just like okay, well, obviously this person did you know 13 events, so obviously they're probably still in good shape. Let's just let's just green light them for next year. I think if anything else, there needs to be a, a better just sort of review process just to make sure that the right candidates are getting forward. There's no, I guarantee there's not a shortage of judges willing to do it, whether there's a shortage of quality judges and it just takes reps. Well, if you're just blank rubber stamping the past year's judges without actually reviewing and making sure that they're the top people in there, how about replacing them with somebody – let let them get their get some uh, experience, and then let somebody that's really enjoying and understanding and doing the job at a high level get those gigs. Don't just be the uh, you know. Uh, let me reward my buddy. It's a, it, you know, and, and I hate to say this because uh, when you say "good old boy network," like that's what it feels it, like. It, it, it's, I think that sometimes has some negative connotations. I think "good old boy network" may even have like racial connotations to it. But well, not sense, saying yeah, that. Not saying yeah, that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But saying that, like, hey, it's the people I know. Hey, we, he's yeah. always been here. We've always done this. Supposedly, and I've been told that Bob Bennett did actually have a system where he tracked the judges, and he tracked. And you see, like MMA decisions does it. You know, percentage of uh, you know decisions where you were on the wrong side, where you had. The, the 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 wrong decision and what i was told is there the one flaw in that system is let's say you're a highly qualified judge and you happen to be put together with two maybe less qualified judges and you actually score it right but they score it wrong you actually get the the negative mark there because you were the one that was on the wrong side of the decision I gotcha. you, you see what i'm saying yeah, so, yeah, so you went against the, uh, even though technically yeah. you scored it right because you went against them two that scored it wrong, you actually get a negative mark. So there's a flaw in that system because you're the dissenting judge, right? So so you got to consider that when you when you say dissenting judge, remember that that doesn't necessarily mean wrong judge. You can be right. right. I don't know what the right way to do it is. You know whether it would be we have you know the guy that we trust as the judge of all judges. You know it can't be a John McCarthy now that he's on the broadcast side yeah. of it. But I don't know if if you had somebody that you were like. This is the most educated judge, yeah. or maybe you know, I do like that that interview he came out where he said that his son he thought his got son it got wrong. it wrong. So at least you know he's going to be straight yeah. up about it, right? So yeah. I don't know if it would be that, or That's I don't be know. An awkward Christmas dinner. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> bud. <for that. laughs> so funny. Can you pass the stuffing? No, Dad. I will not pass the stuffing. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know which decision to make here. Should I or should I not? Am I making the right decision here, did, Dad? Did you really want the potatoes and not the stuffing? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what the system we. You know, would it be? Taking the MMA media scores, which again, I mean, that gets into a whole other ball. Like, who's yeah. actually qualified? Who the, are you taking the judge uh, the scores of people who haven't even passed the certification test? Yeah. Like, what is it? So, I don't know what it'd be, but I would love to see some kind of standard, and not just the decision as a whole, but maybe just every single round that you score, and then that all goes into a database. I mean, I'm sure we're probably getting to some point where the, like AI can determine who should be the proper winner. I don't know, yeah. but and then isn't that that like the it was it PFL? What do they call it? That isn't that an AI score? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The the smart. Uh, what is, what the do PFR? they call it? That the, the PFR or something. You're right. so, that, I will say out of all the things, that and the and like the, I think like the punch speed or whatever yeah. the two things that like I just don't even look at. Yeah. Uh, did you see that? Uh, I'm now I'm just running off in the crazy tangent. Just thinking about AI shit. Did you see that little video? Like Chris Curtis, his mouth guard. 
Yeah. That it was custom tracking, like the strikes so cool. and other stuff. Like the the technology is getting so good. So I mean, like it makes sense that eventually somebody could, you know, sort of do it. But I mean, I think there is still an algorithm. There is. You can't just purely take it it's on numbers. It's got human element. It's got you human element. Take it purely you on can't. numbers. But, you know. but so anyway, I would like to see again. I mean, every judge measured against some standard, and then those judge again. Who's getting the highest assignments? What's the one that's that's you know ninety five percent of their rounds are what you would expect to be the result? Yep. You know what I mean? Who's got the highest versus the lowest variance? And and all these things. That's where I think we need to get to. So when it's like this system doesn't work, that we need to go you know half point system. We need to go full. To me, it's not that man. To me, it is making sure we are actively evaluating, actively educating, actively tracking. And, and, and rewarding the best with the best assignments and the ones that are the lowest, we work with them that they have to take extra training or they have yep. to do shadow judging or whatever. You know what I mean? That, to me, is how we get better. Yeah. And and it probably certainly wouldn't – I mean, I'm just going to be the weird conserv- uh, controversy guy now, uh, especially when these guys are underpaid. They're not, they're not getting paid a lot of money. You know, people were starting to look at – crazy things with the whole Krause situation, the betting thing, but people are starting to look at, okay, there was a crazy betting swing, you know, what possibly changed things. Now you have underpaid people that are controlling and swinging things. I'm not trying to say like these judges are dirty, but if you start tracking stuff, how many questionable calls are in some things? And these are by people that are underpaid, as everybody right. says, and making these crazy things that are Not making any insinuations, of- but, but it, let's rule it out. At some point, yeah. I mean, if you're tracking the numbers and if there's a crazy red flag on some of these things, it should be tracked. There should be a review process where somebody's like, why did random X guy here make these massive wrong decisions where he was the dissenting person? And I get it where, you know, this guy says, hey, you can't you can't pay attention to public comment. You know, at some point you just got to focus on your job. But if you have 50 different people out there that are judging a thing and 50 say it's one thing. They're not calling each other up to say, hey, bro, let's pick this guy just so we can make it look. There's something to be said. Right. You know, people need to look at that. If 50 outside observers for different organizations can say, this is clearly the score, but you have a random outlier over here, you need to be able to say and understand why that is. And part of that, unfortunately, you need to take the equation out. Is this person on the level? Is he being legit? You know, Because if they're willing to think that a, a, uh, a coach – for a team can maybe sway things. How about the people that are actually making the decisions mm. on whether or not a fighter wins or lose? That's where I think there needs to be some better thing. And what better way to combat people starting to think like, well, is this judge legit? Than to have some sort of system that tracks and understands how they're actually. I got the data to back it up. I got the data up. to back it up. It just makes sense. And let there be a review process. Because if there's no review process and you don't have the data – there's always going to be people questioning whether or not the judge is on a level is on is is scoring it on the level. Yep. It just makes sense. I mean, I mean, it's it's there's too much money involved, and there's too much even just thinking about there's too much money involved on these fighters' lives to have somebody you know go in there maybe just wishy washy and whatever you know what's going on. And the, every judge that goes in there needs to be at the top of their game because every fighter that's going in there has two or three opportunities to make money. A year, and if you have something that's like, uh, well, I'm kind of a little iffy on the rules, and we haven't really read over it. You know, there was once last year I think we talked about the new rules, and we got together, and that's about it. Now I just I do these events, and then I go work at my casino that I own. You know, off yeah. the other days, it doesn't make any sense that there's not some something on the level that people can say. Well, when was the last time this guy did training? I don't know when yeah. any judge last time did a class. How, how or a many? How, I mean, obviously, I don't work for Gannett anymore. But how many training seminars did we have to uh, do over the course of a year like, that was like? You got to take your HR one. You got to yeah. take your sexual harassment one. You got to take this one. You got to yeah. take that one over and over. And I have certificates to prove it. That's right. You know what I mean? Show me your certificates. I mean, what's wrong with just review? Hey, once a quarter, once yeah. every six months, once a year at, at worst, you know, like yeah. a review test of like what is the criteria? Yeah. What are we looking at? I May- think it would go a long way if commissions could say this is the last time our judges did this or this or whatever just to be on the level. I mean, like every organization does that. You know, it's, it just seems like that would be part of the yearly performance review or That's something, it. you know. And if people say, well, I don't get paid enough to do that. Then get out. Then get out. Because somebody else will. Yeah. Somebody else absolutely will. If it's yeah. too much of your time to take a 30-minute – training class or a test or yeah. something to make sure that you know that you're in charge of this stuff that is highly important as you said to these people's career and, and that 30 yeah. minutes you ain't got that much time then get out yep you know what i mean 
So I, that's where I want to see it moved. I, 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 that's where I want to see everybody's focus is on better regulation, better administration, better evaluation, better education. I think if we do that, we don't need to worry about changing the whole system, yeah. blowing it up and starting just, over. Just take it from behind the back door. I mean, it, everything seems like behind uh, behind the paywall or behind yeah. a curtain. We don't get to see it. We don't know, understand the process. I think people just want to feel that it's all on the level and have a, a clear understanding that people are going in there with a proper sense of education, that they're knowing that they're at the top of their level. You know, just show us that they're at the top of the level. That's it. Don't, don't just have us expect that, okay, well, he's at the event, so obviously they have to be the right choice. I mean, we see, I mean we've seen the process of how these people get picked, and it, it just seems random. Mm -hmm. It just seems like there's no real sort of process behind it. It would just be nice if it was a clear understanding of why this person was picked to work this event. To be, you know, to a lot, to a lot. I'll tell you what's funny. You brought up the, the 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 gambling aspect of things. Obviously, that's still very much a big story that's not going to go away anytime soon. But uh, so I don't talk about it much on here out of respect for my longtime friend. But I do another podcast as well. Uh, Cage side with so John confusing. Morgan. Yeah, it's fucking confusing. Started a few months ago. So by uh, the way, we're going to name this one now just the MMA Roadshow. <laughs> I don't want it to be confused with that other with John Morgan. He wants podcast. to take he wants to take John Morgan out of it, even though John Morgan's in both of them. But it's for Grind City Media, which is a media company that's owned by the Memphis Grizzlies. Well, recently, uh, I had to take a, a, a training seminar for the for the gaming policy for the NBA. Everybody in the organization had to, and it was eye opening, man. And I don't know that the U that the UFC or that you know these other major organizations. I think there'll be a real legal discussion of how much they can do because. They're uh, contractors, right? They're not employees. But, I mean, this this gaming policy for the NBA that everybody has to take is, is pretty incredible. And I, I won't read the whole thing for you. It's a four-page document. And we had to take a, a training seminar like we talked about and pass a test at the end of it and all that. But it just starts out and says, uh, integrity is one of the NBA's core values. It defines who we are, what we do, and how we are perceived. Everyone associated with the NBA, governors, team investors, team and league employees, players and referees, is expected to conduct themselves in accordance with the highest standards of honesty, fairness, and ethical dealings, understandably so. So the NBA policy is essentially you do not bet on anything in the NBA or any of its associated leagues. That means WNBA, G League, NBA 2K League, which I thought was crazy. So that's the video game league. The, the Basketball Africa League and any other league associated with the NBA. So anything that has to do with basketball, uh, betting on who will be the first pick in a draft, betting on you know anything that's related to basketball, you do not bet on. And so that applies to me now. Not that I'm a gambler by any stretch, but uh, so I, because I do a podcast on their media network, can cannot bet on anything NBA related. You also can't do any illegal gambling, which means – so you, you just can't bet on basketball. Now, if you want to come to Vegas and, like, play some blackjack or play some poker, all good. You want, to, yeah. you want to bet on football, all good. You just can't bet on anything basketball. Now, no illegal gambling. So, like, the offshores and the unregulated books, you can't do anything with them. So that now if you want to bet football with them on an offshore, can't do that. You want to play their, their casino games on the offshore, can't do that. But if you're in a legal casino, a regulated casino – so that's some of the hardcore shit. Like, who goes to some offshore illegal stuff? I know, like, right? Like, I know. I mean, I guess I get it if you live in a place that's not cool, like Las Vegas. I mean, like, uh, well, I we, we're kind of we're kind of spoiled. We're kind of <laughs> spoiled. Uh, and then there are so there's there's actually extra rules for referees. Referees can't bet on anything. Makes, uh, that makes sense. Like, they, yeah, they basically are limited. They can't do any sports betting whatsoever. And I do think that makes sense. Um, and then there's no fixing of games, obviously. <laughs> No, no. They had to say it. They, I know, right? Like, come on, you should know. There's no, there's no tipping. Guys, we're just gonna be sure. You can't fix a game, all right? Just, it's just, just, just wanna say it. We're just putting it. It's, it's in paper. That's the one. Like, you know, coffee is hot or whatever. Like, yeah, okay, got it. Uh, no tipping, of course, which is disclosing confidential information. No playing in basketball fantasy games. And they even said in the training video, they were like, "What if it's a free one? Like, what if there's not any, even any money involved?" And they were like. Nope, can't even That's play in the basketball fantasy league. So anyway, I thought that was uh, I thought that was interesting. Here's the part: the penalties, the disciplinary action should your should your find uh, should should you be found to be in a violation of this include fines, suspensions, termination of employment, and disqualification from any further association with an NBA league or its team. So basically, you can get banned from the sport. Um, I'm gonna be interested to see where it goes because I gotta think that somehow the UFC is going to come up with something similar to this. Except that this applies to employees, and now you're talking about contracted, uh, you know, contract labor. So I don't know how far they can go with it. So I'm kind of interested to see what's possible. But it was pretty eye-opening to see this. So 
it's pretty wild because you know what's been really interesting about this whole is about this whole uh, gambling story is that when it first came out that the UFC was like fighters can't gamble. Like we've always said it, but we got to make sure it's official now. Fighters can't gamble. There were a lot of people that were like. Bro, don't you understand that fighters make a lot of money this way? It was like, you know, people were kind of defending the right that they had to do it. And then yeah. the crowd stuff broke. And then, But now that, I'm, that I was forced to read through a policy from another major organization, like, dude, think about, like, when we wrote stories about Justin James betting on himself with his entire yep. purse. And, you know what I mean? We kind of glorified yep. it. We were like, wow, can you believe it? You know, some people said it was dumb, but whatever. It's like, you know – that was a year ago, and we're like, we like, we of course we know fi- fighters gamble. Of course we know they they bet on everything. And now you see what the policy is for for other leagues. It's like, whoa, this is going to change dramatically. I mean, it's still weird to see them. They'll put odds up still, like on the fights. You know, like who the underdog is, and like here you're telling that your fighters can't do whatever, and you don't want to be part of your sport, but it's still part of your broadcast. Yeah, your talent talking about who's the heavy underdog, who's a blah blah blah. Oh, they're not At giving away. Point, they're not giving away that DraftKings money. They're you know, changing the policy. But they ain't giving away that yeah. DraftKings money. And it's just really weird, you know. I mean, it just it sounds very, very, you know, be one thing or the other, you know. Like if you're gonna try to be this beacon of okay, we're not gonna allow people to do it. We're trying to be on the right side of things. Don't put it on your broadcast because how is your broadcast not sort of influencing it? Because then if you're, you got a guy coming in, you got, you got the, the, the announcers talking about how this guy's coming in on a lost streak, but you can't believe he's a heavy underdog. You know, people are blah, blah, blah. I'm like, bro, you're you're altering it right there. You're, you're giving <laughs> – you're contributing it to swing it one way or another right there on your broadcast, but yet you don't want people to, to gamble. It's like just do one or the other, you know. You want the sport to be good. That's the way the, the NFL used to be, be right, where the NFL would not yeah. – like they would never allow any discussion of gambling. Right. Points, lines, spreads, they would never. Now they're starting to open up a little bit more. Well, plus two, they did because they thought that that was, I think, partially because uh, they always wanted to get into Vegas. Right. And then, like, everybody was like, well, we're not quite sure if you can keep the two separate. And then once it opened up, I think they were just like, well, everything's cool. Right. You know, we're in, we're in Vegas and, yeah. and the, yeah. The, yeah, the ceiling hasn't burned down yet. You know, we're still able to do it. It's just weird that, you know, it just seems weird to me, you know, that. For one, you're going to come out and try to, you know, say our people are not going to do this, this, this. But yet you watch any show and it's thrown up there ten times during a broadcast about the odds and who's the underdog. And, and what parlay hit. And and had you this. bet this, you would have won that. And some guy is throwing a million dollars. I'm like, bro, you're 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 doing it right there. That's the same thing that you're, you're just trying to say a coach is off to the side saying right here. You're giving the story about how a guy's just recovering from an in, uh, an injury and he's back fighting, but he's the underdog. But you think that he's got a great chance to come in here? I'm like, how's that not, you know, doing the same thing? What do you think about a wider scale? What do you think about media being able to, to gamble? Because it's funny because I've always said I never do it because I feel weird about it. I did go and open an account at Circa just because yeah. I was hanging out down there. I put money in it. I still haven't made a bet on it because I still feel weird about it. Yeah. Um. But now, especially like as I've seen this. Uh, policy like I mean we have access to a lot of information and, and yeah. access to a lot of people do you think I mean I, there's and I don't think necessarily the argument of like it, do you find it ethical or not like I, I you know I guess that's that's everybody's own particular moral compass but if now that we know how these other leagues handle it and how they consider like insider information and essentially non-public information um to be an issue, do you think media should be allowed to? I would bet? think maybe if it's like, like you said, the non-public thing. I mean, if you're talking about what a fighter says at media day or anything, that's all out there in the public. That's just doing stuff like that. But if you're embedded in with a fight camp, and maybe you're seeing something that some other people don't, and you're like the the coach is like, don't show this, don't do whatever, don't this. You know, he's been fighting off this thing. Maybe that is the point where you're like, okay, this person had inside information. Maybe that's the line. But that's if interesting, it, but right? If, but if it's you're, everything that's you, on the level, then that's all in public information that anybody can, you know. That's a good point. Like if it happens in the media, if it's on, if it's on camera, if it's out there, like now, granted, that doesn't mean that people took the time to watch it, but it was there. Yeah. It was public information. But if somebody pulls you aside and you're like, hey, Coach X, like you know, how's how's so and so looking? Yeah. Man, I, I we barely got through this camp, yeah. man. Like we're in I would bad say shape. If you're, the, if you're the kind of person that's always like hanging out with a camp or hanging out with a team, and you're closer in, tied with them, and like your your buddy buddies, and you're, you're not obviously a unbiased media person, and you're having inside sort of information, that's the kind of thing. You, 
that I would not be opposed to that be the sort of thing where they're saying that no poo poo on that, you it's know, because you do have some stuff. But if it's so stuff I wonder, that's like, out if you, in the public, like so, like anybody has access to that. Like pro practices aren't open to the public, so to speak. Right. But a lot of journalists, you know, have an invitation because they have a good relationship with the team. That the coach is like, if you want to come watch practice, but you even can. That, but that's the thing. But that's that's open. But if you find something that if you're ever, I think if you're ever like, don't show this, don't film this, don't this because of this, 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 that's when it becomes something else. If you're just, I think, at a private, uh, even if the practice is uh, typically closed, but you have permission to be there, right. if you see everything on the level, like it's a practice and everything looks fine, I don't think that's anything that anybody else couldn't have got. But if, if, if somebody was like, you see somebody and they're like, ah, and they tweak their back and the coach is yeah, like. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. And the coach is like, hey, can you not say anything about it? Right. Don't go bet on some shit because yeah. that's the kind of thing that I think that be that considered. I can see where that is the same sort of insider information that people can get in trouble with. Mm-hmm. If that I guess makes it easier for them to say, okay, no media can do it. I mean, but for the most part, most of us don't have access or don't or choose to not go mm-hmm. and put ourselves in that situation. If I only see the stuff I see at media day or the stuff that's just open to the public, and I'm putting the same interview, I mean, don't stop me because I'm not I'm not getting inside right. information. But, you know, I mean, not that I gamble much, but I, for fun, I'll throw random ass parlays. Yeah, I, mean, I, I love, like, I'll put like seven or eight fight parlays to, just for fun. Yeah, to be honest, like, I don't have an issue. Like, when people be like, hey, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, the, the five bucks down on a five fight parlay yeah. or something like that. Like, that's, that My to me. Is, I always do like eight, t- yeah. eight team parlays. That to me is like <laughs> almost like playing a lottery ticket it's almost. A lottery. You know what I mean? But if you're like, yeah, like if you're a media member and you're and you're like, yeah, I'm you know I'm gambling two or three grand a week or something yeah. like that's that's well that's good l- for you that you have two or three grand. <laughs> I think I put one. Yeah, you're definitely not a. Me- First of all, let me say there is no media member yeah. gambling two to three grand a week. Because <laughs> I think what did I do the other day? I put like tw- it was like twenty dollars in random parlays, twenty five dollars maybe twenty five dollars in like it was like fifteen. 10 or 15 random parlays, but most of them were like five to like eight parlays. Yeah. I had one that hit five, like five team parlay, but it was like all favorite. So it got me like $27. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you know, I, w- I wasn't breaking well, the bank. It was like my two or three dollar parlay. I'm but it was sorry, all buddy, favorites. but I know we're friends, but I'm going to have to call the gaming commission <laughs> I now. I think, like, I think you he really. Made, he made $27. <laughs> I, think I, ca- I think I squared even with all the other ones or something. Do you know the type of money that's being siphoned out of these casinos <laughs> by. by- yeah. Guys like this, but I mean, it, it is definitely. I mean, it's 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 worthy uh, of discussion. I mean, um, just because I mean, there is a possibility. If, I think if somebody was spending a lot of time with fighters behind doors and had the possibility of seeing a lot of stuff, a lot of training stuff, and that person also happens to be winning a lot of gambling, mm-hmm. maybe it is something to address it. But I I think it's probably few and far between where you're actually having a lot of journalists that are spending time. Um, with a particular camp, and then at that point, you have to question: Are they are they really a journalist, or is it somebody that's like more like just a team, team, PR rep? PR rep. Yeah, you know, it's true. I mean, it's you know, because at some point it does differentiate itself. You know, when all your stuff is just behind the scenes photos of them training and stuff, and then it's all going to their personal accounts, and you're not really, you know, an external media. You're more of their PR team. But I mean, it's definitely worth uh, discussing. But you know, who pays attention to media? I mean, we'll have the random, I see random people every once in a while will follow and say like, I'll see that the person on their Twitter profile shows that they're a betting thing. I don't really know a lot of betting people that are following journalists for their tips. You know, I mean, maybe there are some that do it. But I think I mean, some to just get like information, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah but not, not for the, picks yeah. but yeah more for like you know news interviews yeah. you know stuff because like they that. they want to know what's going on they in the fight. Get, they, they want to get the information yeah. in the fight camp and stuff a lot of other stuff or stuff on the level but um we're not really certainly swinging the money you know around right. but i mean if they did follow me they would be following the first two time you MMA junkie staff picks. It's official. Yes, it I mean, it was basically clinched before you even went yeah, in last. Yeah, but still, even that last one, I was going in with uh, a seven uh, lead, and then uh, there were only six fights, so it was already done. But I ended up winning uh, with a six uh, six pick lead. Wow. Which I have to think has to be one of the bigger leads. I, I think, think so. Yeah, we've usually had some but pretty man, close I was ones. going in there at one point with like nine. I was like, bro, if I could just swing with that, I'd just be like, look at this dick coming in the room. <laughs> Clear it away. Clear the way. I'm swinging it. Get out the way. But still, six is pretty good. But, yeah, so it'll be interesting uh, next year when they start doing the picks to see the 
the two years listed in there. First two-time winner. First two-time one. And that means three-time winners between the MMA road I'm show, telling bro. You. I'm telling you. Listen to here for your picks, baby. <laughs> or don't. Or don't. <laughs> or just have fun talking MMA with some dudes yeah. with a cold beer. All right, listen. Holidays coming up, as we said. No card this week. Uh, so enjoy your holidays. I've got some uh, I got some Christmas Eve plans. My wife born and raised in Mexico. Uh, so for her, Christmas Eve is more of the bigger day than Christmas. And so I've got some surprise plans made. They don't know what it is yet. I'm going to surprise them with a pretty cool night that I'll be happy to talk about afterwards. I, I'm actually excited. It's kind of a it's a present for all of us, to be honest yeah. with you. Like it's, it's an experience that I'm pretty stoked about as well. So, But uh, only only people that are on Patreon will find out. No, that's right. Kidding. I'll tell them about it after you. <laughs> Patreon.com slash the MMA Roadshow if you want to find out about the special plans. All of a sudden, I'll see you. Danielle yeah, was just going to subscribe. <laughs> Who is this D. Morgan in here? <laughs> D. Morgan. Uh, too funny. But, yeah, so enjoy your Christmas Eve. Enjoy your Christmas or whatever you celebrate. Just enjoy your holidays. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, we'll be back next week for the uh, regular episode. And then I will make the trip out to Philadelphia for Fury Professional Grappling 6. Those are always a lot of fun. And like I said, we got Bert Watson out there. Got, maybe so. Got a lot of got a lot of UFC talent on it, so it'll be a lot of fun. And I'm going to fly back on New Year's. Watch the uh, show via tape delay and uh, maybe have Frosty Beverage 2 heading into 2023. Maybe. Okay, I'm going to have a lot of them. <laughs> like it was a question, like, well, well maybe. You know, I'm gonna, you know, this is the year I'm going to start my resolutions early. Mm. I'm not going to drink as much. But on the 31st. But on the 31st, <laughs> it's on. <laughs> Everybody have a good time. Uh, we'll rejoin you next week, and uh, we'll finish up the year strong. In the meantime, thanks for listening. 